so cool thank you Dorina <laughs> thanks so for awesome. having me here thank you I just totally nerded out so okay. <laughs> uh, so welcome thank you for coming thank you it's lovely to be here um, do you want to talk about what you just played oh yeah sure <laughs> so the first piece I played was very old it was by a German composer named Bach um, he had uh, many many children so he was very uh, prolific in child making and music writing so <laughs> that was probably one of his most well-known uh, cello pieces. You guys probably have heard it somewhere before, right? Like Nike commercials and basically anything with a cello, it's like synonymous. Oh, it's that, that's the cello piece. Um, and then after that uh, was actually the main theme from the new Wonder Woman uh, series. Um, and I did do the original with Hans Zimmer. Ooh. So uh, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, and it's very exciting that very soon we're going to start working on Wonder Woman 2. Uh, yes. Some music for that, so I'm very excited about that. And, awesome. And that was it. Now I'm sitting here. Cool. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Well, I am a huge fan of Dina. Um, I actually uh, met her a couple years ago. I gave her my business card because I was like, I need to meet you. Like, it was like really creepy in like a stalkerish way. Um, so I was I like, like, hey, stalkers. let me interview you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so thank you for coming. I, I've actually seen her twice in concert. It, it's, it, she's amazing. So uh, I wanted to start with really background questions. Like, when did you start playing the cello? What made you choose that particular instrument? Was it kind of like your choice? Was it like forced upon you by your parents? Like, what, what was that? Yes, yeah, so uh, I was born in Shanghai, China. So I was made in China. Um, and uh, my first instrument, like many, many Chinese children, was piano. Uh, so I started when I was three years old. And then later I moved to the U.S. My parents are actually both classical musicians, so they're classical music teachers who live in San Diego. Uh, and they, so they popped me out, and then they came to the U.S. because they were able to uh, have an opportunity to go to school in the U.S. for music, get a scholarship, and that was very, very rare in like post-communist China, like right after. So they took the opportunity, and my grandparents, my mom's parents, actually raised me uh, for a few years while they were here studying. I got really, really large. I weighed when I came to America. I'm not kidding you. I was like. 82 pounds at five years old. That is not normal, right? So <laughs> I was like a little round ball. Ah, I play the piano. Um, and then I moved here, uh, and my parents thought that I should play one of the instruments that they knew how to play, because obviously that would save money on music lessons. So I started on the violin. I was really bad. I, I played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for, I'm again, I'm not exaggerating, like six months. Like I couldn't, I could not get past Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Like wow, she's not talented, right? So um, then I switched to the cello, and for some reason, even though it's like kind of similar, it just came a lot more naturally, um, and the, and I seemed to like progress pretty quickly. So uh, my dad decided, okay, this is what she's gonna play, and from there on out, I was, f I have to say, forced. To be honest, I was forced to practice uh, eight hours a day, 
every day, which I'm grateful for now. Uh, I didn't have much of a childhood, I have to admit, uh, and I was very angsty, hence probably my love for metal now. I was very like, oh, I hate my life. Um, um, and my parents, I mean, it was, it was really extreme, and I've talked about it before, so hopefully they'll forgive me for like, you know, spilling the, the family secrets, but they would like lock me in my room sometimes to practice, and then like let me out once in a while to go to the bathroom, maybe eat something if I was lucky. Um, but I have to say that type of like, very regimented, strict training. Um, really, it, I have to say it did pay off in the end because, like, if you don't practice for that many hours every day, you know, whether it's cello or swimming or basketball, you don't build that type of muscle memory. So I was like more comfortable playing the cello than really doing anything else. Um, so yeah, uh, to answer your question, I was forced into the family trade, but I'm happy to be here now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that sounds. Uh, your your parents sound both terrifying, but also thank you to your parents for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're definitely happen. terrifying. <laughs> but but also at the same time, I mean, I don't. I think it actually takes a lot of uh, courage yes. and a lot of like determination and sacrifice on their part, you know. Because I, when I have babies, I don't have kids yet, but I'm like, I don't know if I can spend that many hours, yes. like, you know, like yelling at my kids. Practice. That's some dedication can, yeah, for dedication. sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, you know, whether it was growing up or now, you know, uh, what do you think? Where you know, other than your parents, uh, music influences that, that, you know, kind of affected you or that inspired you to, like, keep playing and, and uh, you know, this, whether it's this instrument or, or other type of music, because you mentioned metal as well. Yeah, definitely. So, um, again, growing up, because my parents were ultra conservative and just very, very, you know, classical music is good. Anything else is the music of the devil. You can't listen to it. So I actually, and of course, what happens when you don't allow people to do something they get very curious especially me because I'm really a contrarian in many ways I'm like oh yeah I'm gonna um so Same. Uh, <laughs> so the very first exposure that I had to like I guess heavier music or the underground alternative was a uh, Marilyn Manson and how did this come about so I was in uh, I was in seventh grade this was a little bit later in life I mean that's not that late in life but seventh grade um and I, I remember I had this crush on uh, a kid named Luke he was like a combination of a goth and a nerd. He was like a ner nerdy goth, right? He had these really thick Coke bottle glasses with like thick black rims. Uh, but he also had like long hair, like down in the shoulders and like black lipstick. I'm like, oh my God, like, who is this kid? He's so weird. I love it. And, and um, the neighborhood we grew up in was not very alternative or like, you know, so everybody was pretty much the same, very preppy. Um, like the weird one, you. <laughs> yes, I'm like, he's weird. I'm going to follow him around at lunch like like a little loser, like a stalker, right? Um, and then so one day he's like, hey, Tina, have you heard of Marilyn Manson? I'm like, who's she? No, I don't know who that is. Um, so he let me borrow his Antichrist Superstar CD because back in those days we listened to CDs. Good CD. Uh, yeah, and I, I had a boom box in my room that we got at a garage sale from the next door neighbor, so nearby garage sale. Um, and there's a CD player at the top. And I remember I would turn the volume all the way down to like a little bit pat, like, below one, so like 0.9 volume, and put my ear up against the boombox, because my parents, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here today, I'd be dead uh, if they heard that, so, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm so cool. <laughs> so that actually had a huge impact on me, because I, I mean, imagine coming from classical music to, I guess that's like industrial, it's not really metal, but like heavy industrial oh, yeah dark music and I was just goth so music. goth music and I was I was very fascinated by it I started like trying to like um oh I found a clip sorry I'm gonna go way off tangent right now stop me okay so all these memories are pouring back so I found this clip on earring like just like the clip on part there's no actual earring you know like the plastic part that kind of the metal plastic you know what I'm talking about yeah um I'm like oh that would make a really cool nose ring because I wanted to be cool but I didn't have any piercings so I would go to school I would run into the bathroom and clip this like plastic clip on everything like between like like a bowl you know on my nose I'm so cool so Anyway, so that Marilyn Manson, and then uh, a few years later in high school, uh, my best friend, her name is also Tina, uh, and she uh, she had a Guns N' Roses uh, tape, oh my gosh, a cassette tape, Appetite for Destruction, so I heard that, um, and then the third musical influence that I heard, but I only heard the first two tracks of their album was a Daft Punk CD oh. that I got at yet another garage sale, but it was scratched up, so only the first, it wasn't even first two, tra first track and a half worked. And so I would like listen to it for like a track and a half and then it would like skip and then stop working. I rewind it and just keep listening to it. Um, and that was my musical influence, that in classical music. That's so cool. And that actually makes sense. If you follow Tina's career, it makes sense because she's really 
all over the place in a good way. You know, she's not the typical cellist, you know, that you would go see uh, um, at the Disney concert hall. You know, like she does all of this cool stuff. Like I, one of the concerts that I saw her at, um, she ended up playing uh, Super Mario Brothers, uh, the theme, and then all of a sudden went into like a heavy metal version of it. And I freaked out because I was like, this is like, it's like she's dedicating this to me. Like I was, it was so It, it was cool. for you, just for yes, you. <laughs> thank you. That's right. Uh, and it was, and it was really cool. So, you know, like uh, it, it's, it's, you have these, she has albums out, right? Like the, there's this one called Game On where you yes. play um, video game music. So yes. how did that come about? And, and, and how do you, as a musician, you know, because you do, you do your own compositions and arrangements for when you're doing a cover and, like, you know, putting your own spin on it? Like, how does that blend of metal and classical come about? Right, right. So this album that uh, she's talking about, it was actually my first album. I finally got signed to, like, a, a major label to Sony uh, two, almost two years ago. So Game On was the first uh, label-released album that I did. But pr actually, previous to that, I self-released nine albums by myself. So I self-funded it. I recorded so cool. it myself. Didn't know what I was doing, but I figured it out along the way. If you listen to, like, my oldest albums, it's like, well, that's, like, really bad, you know? And it, hopefully it gets a little bit better as I'm figuring out what to do. Um, but I, you know, I released uh, albums that were fully classical and my parents were happy about that and then I did some like super metal ones there was one called cello metal because yes. that's just how creative I am cello metal um and then uh so when I got signed to uh Sony it was weird timing because I had planned on doing a music video uh, music video sorry a uh, game music album and I've been since I moved to LA I feel like everyone's in the entertainment industry in some way or another um so I started doing when I came to college uh as like a you know side gig to make money amongst other things I try to sell Avon, et cetera. I wasn't very good at that. Um, but I started doing session work, and slowly I built that up. And I, I end, ended up playing on a lot of video game, like in the actual soundtrack. So I had thought, oh, maybe I should do some versions of my own of the stuff that I've played on or some of my favorite game music. Um, and so when Sony signed me, they said, oh, we were thinking that maybe you could do like a video game music album. Like, no way. Check out my spreadsheet, because I love Google spreadsheets. So I already had a spreadsheet of all the music I wanted to do, you know, the tracks. Um, and so it was really one of those situations where it was like perfect, perfect timing. Um, and so I just kind of picked some of my favorite music, some of the games that I, I did like play a little bit and then some just like epic music that I love, like Final Fantasy VII. I mean, it's just like opulent music. Um, so that's how that kind of came about. So cool. Do you have a favorite video game? Um, it doesn't count. I don't know if it counts as a video game, but like what I'm playing right now, which is really bad. I don't know if you guys play Homescapes or Gardenscapes. No, Anybody? you're like, what's that? <laughs> it's like my mom plays it too. That's when you know it's bad. I was like telling my mom, oh, I found this thing like Gardenscapes. <gasps> What? Me too. I play Gardenscape. I'm like, oh no, I'm like playing the same games as my mom. Um, it's kind of like little matching games, and then you can like win points and like upgrade your garden. I, I know. Okay. Yeah. Not I mean, metal. I, I would play it. Okay. I mean, probably. It's, really, it's like on iPad and your iPhone okay. and stuff. Oh, cool. no, yeah. there you go. Now we have to check it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Promoting Gardenscape. Oh no. <laughs> um, so yeah, you mentioned your uh, album Cello Metal. Yes. Um, and I mean. You have songs by like Black Sabbath and uh, you know Metallica, Slayer. Like it's so so. It's these are these are not just covers, right? Like there's like arrangements that go into this. That like, did you end up you know really getting into metal? And then it seems like sometimes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like when you're playing uh, the metal versions of songs, like you you kind of treat the cello like a guitar. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So when I was listening to that Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction, you know, Slash, I was like, oh my God, I want to be Slash. How do I become Slash? So um, I think basically what I did with the electric cello is just try to experiment with it. I use, you know, guitar effects. This is a pedal board meant for a guitar player. Um, but I thought that's close enough. You know, it's kind of in the same range. And so, um, yeah, that's exactly what I try to do. And even with the Wonder Woman main theme, I sometimes, you know, I, I would go on YouTube and look at, they people just upload like the track and there's some comments like, oh, the guitar is cool. I'm like, it's not a guitar, it's cello. Yeah. But but at the same time, it's good because I want it to sound like a guitar player. So the fact that it's a little bit confusing is like both a good and a bad thing, you know? So. Yeah, no, then that's true. It's actually, I, I because I'm a nerd, uh, I've also corrected people because they'll be like, oh yeah, I love that little like guitar solo in Wonder Woman. I'm like, that is a cello. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, 
So uh, speaking of Wonder Woman, um, that is such a cool, exp that must be such a cool experience. You know, uh, tell us about that. Like, what was it like to, to get involved, first of all, with, uh, you know, one of my favorite composers of all time, which is Hans Zimmer, you know, and, uh, and then Junkie XL, that, that they made this really cool, iconic theme. Well, you know, what was it like, and, and, and how did that process come about uh, to get involved, to be involved in such an iconic movie? Right, so um, I think to, to backtrack, the way that I met Hans was actually through YouTube. Um, and because my, so my very, very first music video, I released it, oh my gosh, like 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, I'm old. So 10, no, I'm not that old, but 10 years ago. Um, it's called Queen Bee, and it was my like metal version of Flight of the Bumblebee. I know it's been done before, but you know, I was just starting, I wasn't very original. But anyway, so um, I did a metal cover, and he actually saw the music video, because he spends a lot of time watching YouTube videos, like looking at musicians. Um, and his office actually contacted me. Um, and at the time, I wasn't my I was trying to become like a metal cellist. My, my life goal was to play with Rammstein. And like, that's what and I thought, like, oh, if I like release this music video, maybe like metal bands will see the video and they'll be like, oh, she should like come play with us. So that was my entire purpose. Um, but instead, that somehow accidentally segued me into um, a career in soundtrack work. So now, like the majority of my work here in L.A., I work on, you know, movie scores, TV scores, video game stuff. Um, and so he saw the video, called me. I ended up, uh, the first movie that we worked on together was Sherlock Holmes, um, the very first one. I remember I walked in. I, I actually, I, so bad. If he watches this, please don't get offended, Hans. Sorry. Um, I, I actually didn't know who he was. So when his assistant called, like, I'm calling from Hans Zimmer's office. I'm like, who? What? Um, so... <laughs> I went in, I still didn't know what I was expecting to his office in Santa Monica. And they're like, oh, Hans is having lunch in the next building because there's like all these buildings. So I went up there and I did recognize Guy Ritchie. They were like having a, having lunch. And so I sat down and there's like all these like, you know, cool celebrity people and then, like me, I'm like, oh, wow, okay, I guess I'm in a good situation. And so um, that's how we started working together. And then we worked on a bunch of uh, Inception, a lot of movies after that. Um, and so this one, I think they had actually been experimenting. Originally, they were thinking it'd be a vocal, like a female vocal. And for some reason, you know, they tried different singers. Like, it just wasn't quite fitting. And then Hans said, oh, we should have Tina come in with her electric cello and do some weird shrieking sounds, you know, like a screaming Amazon. Um, and so I went in. And that, I mean, it's a pretty, it's like a simple melody that repeats over and over and over. I'm must have, I mean, I literally played it like at least a thousand times, you know, over and over and over. But we finally figured it out. And the um, the theme is actually layered. It's it's not just one electric cello, but it's like 30 layers of electric cello to get that like really fast. And that's sound. all you. Yes, it's all me. So yeah, lots of multi-tracking. Um, and actually, Junkie, I, I've never even met him in person. He wasn't actually there. So it was just myself and Hans and then all of Hans's people's right. you know <laughs> entourage yeah, yeah 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 so it was but really they both compose the theme right uh, I, I believe yeah, so yeah. yeah there's a, a lot of times there's so many people working you know on different components of it so um but yeah definitely that's so cool I mean I remember uh the first time I heard that theme was I think it was Batman v Superman the movie yes and there's that scene where uh spoilers uh Wonder Woman basically saves Batman because she actually has powers. Um, <laughs> no offense to Batman. I love Batman too, uh, but um, and she basically does this, and the music comes on, and you and I hear the cello, and I'm like, oh my god! Like this is like my jam. I was so happy about it. That's so cool. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, speaking of Hans, uh, that's actually one of the best concerts I've been to, and I go to like 30 concerts a year. Like it's bad. Um, and Tina was there, and along with all these other great studio musicians that that uh, Hans brought, and they basically just play his scores. And that's that was such a cool concert. I mean, it was it. They played everything from Inception to Sherlock Holmes. You guys played obviously you played Wonder Woman, Pirates of the Caribbean. Like, what was that like? And and what you know, was that kind of like a dream of you to like, you know, be on stage with, you know, the best musicians in the world? And like, you know, what what's that compared to like, you know, what what you want to do in the future or dreams of yours? Right, right. So, of course, it was, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's on Netflix, like the uh, live in Prague, like our show that we did in Prague. This was two tours ago, two years ago. Um, but when Hans first said, like, oh, we're thinking of maybe taking this on the road instead of being locked up in a dark room all day, you know, writing music. And I thought, great, because for me, I love studio music. But while I'm still young enough to prance around on stage, I want to take the opportunity to travel, to perform live. Um, and so it was really, really amazing. And we played mostly 
arenas, which is crazy because we all thought like, all right, is anyone going to come? Is it going to be like five people, you know? But it was amazing because, I mean, Hans is huge. So all over the world, you know, the arenas were full. So it was an amazing experience. Um, and prior to that, I actually, in a past life, I was in the Cirque du Soleil. Um, and so it was weird to like kind of revisit the same arenas that we played, um, but with Hans this time. And it was just, yeah, I mean, I mean, what can I say? It's really, really, really awesome. And there was good food. Oh, that's I like always I good. like free catering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What? Wait. So you were in Cirque du Soleil? What? What yeah. did you do? I well, I play the. Ch I was okay, kind of okay. like this weird. Oh, I like, thought you were like cello. an acrobat. I was like, oh. no, I'm not that flexible. <laughs> no, I was like a weird cello alien, and I was wearing this outfit. I was skinnier then. I mean, I know I'm not large now, but I had. Um, they put me on a diet. They're like, no, I was the largest person in the entire Jesus. show. Like all these like like acrobat girls with like eight packs. I'm like, Jesus. Christ. So I, I would actually paint on like fake abs to try to like blend in. <laughs> and I remember one time some, some, someone, I think, uh, waiting for us outside of the stage door and they saw me like, oh, you're that cellist. Man, you are cut. I'm like, oh my God. it's makeup. Because from far away, like if you have really bad like makeup on, it actually looks like you're super buff. And I, I have a one pack of like nothing, you know, so and the acrobats are looking at me. They're like working out all day and I'm just eating and catering. <laughs> and I like paint on my abs. Um, but yeah, I was wearing this outfit. It was all Swarovski crystal. And it, it was the Michael Jackson, the Immortal Tour oh, yeah. um, by Cirque du Soleil. So it was actually half owned by the Jackson estate. So this was after Michael passed. Mm -hmm. And so instead of, obviously, he couldn't do the tour, so we, we had his vocals, um, and then uh, it, it was combined with the Cirque du Soleil to add in other elements, and now they have the Michael Jackson, Jackson show in Las Vegas, and that's kind of like the smaller version, but the original one that opened was also an arena tour. Um, so yeah, I did that for two years. I was wow. a gypsy. That's crazy. You've yeah. done everything. No, not everything. And you're so young, and you've done everything. Good for you. Um, so... Uh, you have a new album coming out, out this year, or you're working on this year, right? Hopefully, it'll come out this year. I've okay. only t <laughs> we've only, we're working on song number two, so we'll see how it progresses. C can you tell us? About, uh, can you give us a little bit like of a preview for it, or what you're working? Yeah, on? well, I was like I was telling Dorena earlier, like the idea for this album has already changed like five times. But that's part of the creative process, you know. You you think you have a great idea, and then you do it, and you're like, wow, this is really horrible. And then you erase it, and you start again. Um, so I think we have the general theme now. Um, we're taking. It's not really. A, I mean. It's kind of a cover, but not really a cover because we want. I wanted to do original material, but being that I don't sing and it's instrumental music, it is difficult to have something to grasp. You know, it's not radio friendly. It's not. Um, so we thought, what if we took some classical pieces, but not an entire cover where you just take a short segment, like rappers, they sample stuff that's recognizable, and then kind of like expand that and explode that into something original and different. Um, so that's what we're working on. So it's kind of, I guess you would call it like classically based cinematic metal -y. of course there'll be some metal elements yay, um, yay. <laughs> just for you <laughs> um and yeah that's what we're working on i'm hoping it'll come out around the same time as wonder woman 2 that's like our whole uh, goal for for the timing cool can you tell us anything about the wonder woman music or no no, no spoilers sorry contracts i know i got it i got it. um okay so um i wanted to ask about um since you know you perform with Hans, like, are there collaborators that you work with that just was, you know, it was a very meaningful thing to you, or, or is there somebody that you dream of working with in the future that you're like, oh, I would die if I work with that person? Yes. So I remember how I said that that first music video that I made, and I spent every penny that I had on at the time, and I was like broke after um, uh, this metal music video. I was hoping that Rammstein would see it. I still really would love to work with them, um, but I don't want to. Re my thing is, I don't want. I never reach out to people and say, hey. Like I want to work with you because I, I try to like wait and like manifest it and like hopefully eventually it'll somehow it'll just come or we'll have like mutual friends or something weird will happen. Um, so my dream is that one day I'll be able to play with Ramstein. Um, hello, Ramstein. <laughs> well, we'll send this to him. Okay. <laughs> um, and then um, you were just at Nam recently. Yes. Um, and for those of you that don't know, um, you, if you could explain what that is. But also, um, did you have um, Tina actually has an instrument line, like because she does everything. So can you talk a little bit about that as well? Oh, yes. Yeah. So in addition to music, uh, I'm very, actually very passionate about entrepreneurship and investing, and but that's a whole other thing that we won't go into today. Uh, but one of my, I guess, side businesses uh, is a line of instruments, uh, bows, and pickups for acoustic uh, string instruments. Um, so I, I have a couple of different cello models, classical cello models. Um, we offer bows in both wood and carbon fiber and like custom colors. Uh, you can even get like the hair here. This is actually horse hair, but don't worry, no horse were harmed in the making of any of these bows and we dye them like all kind of different colors um, and so that's just something that I also do on the side. Yeah. And what, what's the difference uh, between you know horsehair and other 
things that are used, uh, other types of hair that are used for bows? Um, usually, so uh, on the bows that I play with the electric cello, I actually try not to go too crazy today because it's noon, and, uh, Monday, so I don't want to be too extra. But if I play really, really hard and I use a normal bow, I'll literally destroy like one bow every 15 minutes maybe because if you hit it really hard, all the hairs will break. And so for actually that cello when I play, I usually use fishing wire because it's it's like plastic. So it doesn't sound as good, but um, it's it lasts a lot longer. Again, since it costs like $80, usually about 80 uh, per rehair. Uh, but for the classical cello, I do use the traditional horse hair on the bows. Yeah. And um, I want to talk about the difference between when, you know, because I actually grew up playing the cello, this one. <laughs> how, you know, how did you transition to doing electric? And, and what do you think is, you know, what were the challenges or what are the difference or what's better or worse between t between both instruments? Right, right. Um, I always tell people the, um, if you compare it to a classical guitar, and an electric guitar, it's it's exactly the same. So yeah, I mean, you're, the frets are in the same place, uh, but as far as, obviously, when I play this cello, I'm sitting, and when I play that, it's standing, and it's actually more difficult to play the electric cello in tune, because your whole body, as you can see, it's just one end pin, so it's kind of like a tripod situation where my legs are like this, right? And, that, and you're kind of like trying to move uh, with it so it doesn't fall over, because when I started, it took me about two years to figure out how to play it without looking super awkward. I'm sure I still look awkward, but, because um, yeah. there's not there's there's some people there's a lot of people who play electric violin there's some people who play electric cello but it's still not a super um, popular thing I guess so I was really trying to figure out how to how to do it yeah. you know and to be able to stand so you can be a little bit more mobile instead of just sitting all the time yeah because if yeah. you're if you're trying to hit the right notes and you're playing like you know and you're moving around like how do you yeah, and there's the no, right notes <laughs> right 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 and there's no frets so it's it's muscle memory so it, it genuinely it took me like two years of non-stop practice on that one just to not sound horrible yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so awesome um and so I, I mentioned I grew up playing the cello I haven't played in years so for somebody like me Wanna play no okay <laughs> definitely not okay <laughs> <laughs> especially after she played <laughs> um so uh for somebody like me that is or you know somebody that's a beginner that's hoping to play or you know it, it like for me it seems very daunting to get back into this just because as you mentioned earlier there's like you know it takes discipline and and you know what what would what advice would you keep give people like me and beginner musicians that or what what you know tips or what do you do to not get uninspired and, and keep playing. Right, I think everything's just about consistency. And I'm not gonna lie and say, you know, you're always gonna wanna practice. I don't even wanna practice sometimes, you know, but I have like the internal Asian tiger parent like already in my brain. So even if I don't want to, I'm like, I, I have to, you know, like I have to. So um, if you just force yourself to be uh, consistent, and I'm not saying eight hours a day because we all have lives, you know, and I don't do eight hours a day anymore. Um, but even if it's like a good 30 minutes, like really focus 30 minutes every day or an hour, um, whether you're learning cello or anything else, it, it does come pretty quickly, but it's mostly about consistency, you know? Yeah. Okay. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, so um, we actually um, only have time for one more question, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, but, um, and then Tina's going to perform one more song and, uh, and then uh, think of some good questions because we'll open up the floor to audience questions. Um, so uh, I wanted to also ask about, um, you've had a lot of partnerships with brands. Yes. And that's interesting, you know, for a musician, like, uh, can you can you tell us about that? I think uh, you worked with Bentley last year, you're working with Ritz Carlton, like, what's that like? And, and how do those things happen? Like, that's so cool. Right, thank you. Uh, definitely very grateful for that. Um, and again, I don't, I don't actually, ha I don't reach out Usually, not usually, I never, I don't reach out to, to brands, you know, I don't have someone pursuing it for me, but, so these happen organically, which I think is the best way for things to happen, um, and so the Bentley partnership, actually the marketing director, Mike Sayer uh, of Bentley in the UK, he came to one of my shows, and then for some reason, he like Instagram messaged me, but you know, on Instagram, if you don't follow them, it goes to your archive messages so I like didn't see his messages for months right and I think finally he like emailed me he's like oh like I tried to message you but you ignored me you know I'm uh, messaging he you stalked you the wrong way he should have <laughs> given you a business card like I did yeah, exactly no he came to the show but then he didn't come like in person you know he didn't leave a card like like she did um so anyway we connected uh and then last year I did uh four performances for Bentley I actually wrote the music I scored a commercial for them for the new Bentega hybrid which is their SUV hybrid SUV 
um, which works with the idea of like, you know, taking something old and, uh, you know, the, uh, Bentley is turning 100 years old this year, so it's a very old company. So taking something that's old, uh, like this cello made in 1880 in Paris, France, um, and transforming it uh, and making it something modern, electric with the, you know, with the hybrid SUV. Um, so we did that, and that was a great partnership for a year. And then this year, uh, I am a brand partner with the Ritz-Carlton. Um, so I'll be visiting some of their different resorts. I know awful job, uh, visiting the resorts and getting inspired by, you know, the lo locations, the experiences, the food that we'll have there, um, and taking that and composing, like, a kind of a soundtrack, a theme song for each location, um, and so, yeah, and then playing a little bit, uh, playing, like, a very short show at each one, uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm super excited about it. We have a meeting on Wednesday, you know, to, to plan the schedule for this year. Cool, man, that sounds like a nice part of the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I love to travel, I love to eat, I love to play music, so. so oh, and my fiancé Rambo gets to come, too. Yeah. Yeah, yay. I Hopefully he that. doesn't get in trouble at work, though. He's supposed to be at work right now, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Hi. Hi. So, first of all, thanks for coming out, and, you know, thanks for having us. Oh, of <laughs> course, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank um, you. I saw you're playing... Not just the cello, but also the air hue. Yes, uh huh. And I was just wondering if you had some thoughts, like how they compare and contrast the spirit of the instrument. Right. So the air hue was that um, you know the tall, thin Chinese thing, um, <laughs> and it's made out of uh, uh, rosewood and snake skin. Um, and I don't really know. I mean, there's a there's a fingerboard, you know, so it's kind of similar to a cello, um, but the strings are actually suspended in the air. I wish I brought one to show you guys. So there's actually you're not actually pressing against anything. So it's just a string, um, and it's I don't know. I don't really. I don't know even know if I play it properly. I'm self taught, so I I, I bought one. Um, actually, wait. Do we have time if I tell a really quick story about how I learned to play the air who? Yes. So. <laughs> I was doing this concert with the Golden State Pops Orchestra, and they were doing a video game music concert. And I was already playing, a, I don't know if you guys played Journey? The, no? Yeah? So I, yeah, Austin Wintry. So I did the original, uh, I played the cello solos for that game. And so we were playing Journey. It's like, oh, Tina, since you're playing in the concert, you're going to be there already, and you're Chinese, do you play the Chinese air who? You know, because all Chinese people play the air who. Um, but I thought... Oh, like, what is it? They're like, yeah, we have this game, and it features the air who. And I thought, wow, another opportunity to be featured on stage? Yeah, I want to do that. I could wear something Chinese. It'll be really fun. But I had, I never played the air who before. So I, li I, like, I lied. I said, yeah, I could play the air who. Just if you could just send me the music ahead of time. so I can. And there was still, like, two weeks till the concert, which is not that much time. Um, and so I got off the phone. Got on Craigslist. I was like searching Air Who, Air Who. Nobody, there was no Air Who's for sale. So I finally found uh, a store in Texas, uh, in Austin, Texas, that had Air Who's with like overnight shipping. <laughs> so I paid like $100 extra for shipping. It arrived. I practiced every night. I didn't sleep. I was like trying to learn. I was watching YouTube videos, like how to, how to play the Air Who. Um, and I, I think I kind of did okay. We used a lot of reverb um, <laughs> in the concert. And it was, it, it was pretty simple. It wasn't a super complicated part, thank you thankfully. Um, so that's how I play the air who. So when you ask me about the air who, I really am not educated on actually what it's supposed to sound like. Um, it sounds very ethnic, I guess, because the, the tonality is different. Um, but it's still like continuous pitch and everything. So I guess you yes. had faith in yourself because you knew like the principles. Yes, the principles. And you just kind of slide around if you miss it. It's like, I meant to do that. It's part of the, it's part of the Chineseness of it. You know, it's like, right. Um, and it's, it is, <laughs> it is very forgiving in that way. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> You. Next question. Hello. Um, do you have anything else you can say about uh, working on Journey with Austin? Like, um, and, you know, what you think about uh, having such, like, evocative visuals to go with your music and those kinds of things? Yeah, so when we started working on Journey, I mean, it was so many years ago. I met Austin uh, through USC uh, at school, um, and we had no idea it was going to turn out to be such a success. You know, it was the first video game ever, ever nominated for Best Soundtrack for a Grammy. Um, but when we did it, like, he was still in his old studio, which was literally, it was just like a room. And, like, you know, we were both just slumming it and, like, trying to figure out what to do. And so I had, we both had no idea that it would turn out to be such a big, um, I guess, a successful game. Um, and, yeah, I remember I just went into a studio a few times. We would, like, try out different ideas. Again, lots of reverb. Um, and I saw some of the early visuals, but it wasn't, it was much later that it was actually like, placed into the game. So, yeah, it was fun. It was great. And I still work with Austin, so it's good. Yeah, he just wrote to me, uh, Instagram messaged me right before I got up here. So. You don't have him blocked, fortunately. I don't what? You don't have him blocked. I don't, ha I don't have him blocked, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Who's next? Over here? 
Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Uh, the effects of the Wonder Woman soundtrack, I mean, I love yes. that oh, thank song. You. Um, made me think a little bit of like Les Claypool or Tom Rillo. Like, I'm curious what it what it's like to learn the classical style versus kind of try to push the envelope of what an instrument is capable of. Like, is there any overlap with some of those artists or are you just out there on your own? Um, yeah, your definitely. Own? I mean, when I started, uh, again, I... YouTube was like my teacher. So when I first got my electric cello, I think it was about yeah about eleven years ago when I was in college. Um, I bought an electric cello with a credit card, you know, from Yamaha. Uh, and then I was like, okay, how what do I do with this? So I would just go on YouTube and watch guitar tutorials and try to like because the tone the tonality again is very very different from a classical instrument. Um, and then also being able to improvise because most of us classical musicians um, are not taught to improvise. You play exactly what you're told to play, and you play it the same way every time, right? So it's uh, it was it was more of like a mental thing even rather than a physical because once you wrap your head around you can do whatever you want you know you can express yourself through the music and then just learning some different scale pa like scalar patterns and passages um, that you can use in like your solos or whatnot uh, and then just playing around with pedals I actually went full digital very very uh, recently this is from uh, line six but I used to I was like a big collector of pedals so like analog pedals um, and I used to love those but after a while there's some feedback issues you know and now with new technology um, this unit right here uh, it's it's both an amp modeler so instead of having like a giant amplifier you know being carried in here um, I just everything is processed through this little pedal board so all the effects all this amp sounds everything is in there so it's really really convenient uh, going off of that uh, is that basically your like piece of equipment you can't live without or do you have something that you really really love that you take yeah, no th you? this is this is it now like before when I did shows oh my gosh I have to hire like a you know a company because these amps are so heavy and of course I like to be melodramatic and have lots of like different amps so they come in like with a big truck unload everything and then all my pedals and this and that and now this little thing on the floor you just put it in a backpack uh, you know I don't carry it my fiance Rambo carries it but still it's easier it's easier for <laughs> it's easier for him <laughs> and he likes it too right Okay. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Thanks very much for coming. Your music is amazing. Thank you. Um, I, what you're talking about with what you've been doing with the electric cello reminds me a lot of, um, have you ever heard of Ronald Jenkins? No. He, he's a keyboardist. Um, I've seen some of his videos on YouTube, um, but he has this one song that's called Guitar Sounds uh -huh. that uh, he's using a keyboard. I actually thought the first time I heard it that it was just entirely electric guitar. Right. And I was so surprised when I learned that it was actually a keyboard. So it might be something interesting for you to look into because he's doing something similar except with a keyboard right, right, that right. you do with the uh, electric cello. And yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's really awesome. cool. Ronald Jenkies, yeah. Got it's it. Really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank huh? you. Maybe you can play with him in Ramstein one day. Yeah, okay. that'd be really cool. <laughs> Concerts. No, Ramstein's mine. I'm not sure. <laughs> that'd be an amazing concert opportunity, but I don't, I mean, I don't, you don't reach out to him, so <laughs> he would have to find you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I check other artists out okay. and stuff, but it's usually for like people that like you know I don't know I don't know what it is I just feel like like energetically is that is that wrong should I be like re I just don't want to be one of those people like oh work with me please I'll play cello for you there's a balance there's you know? a balance yeah. you know I try to it's more of like dangling the carrot I like think you could reach out to Ramstein is all I'm saying hmm, yeah but I'd be like heart so embarrassed and heartbroken if they said no thank you but then nine but then they're not cool okay so <laughs> <nine>. <laughs> I'll give it five more years and then yeah. <laughs> okay next question so uh, speaking of uh, metal, yeah. uh, what are you listening to recently? Not a lot of metal recently, I have to be honest. So uh, recently I've been obsessed with financial uh, YouTube videos. I have them on <laughs> a playlist, and I listen to them every morning if I'm putting on makeup. Uh, but as far as like metal, obviously Rammstein is like my big uh, obsession, obsession. And I'm, I'm more into, like you, when you mentioned earlier about my cello metal album, more of the classic uh, old school metal like now I'm honestly I, I haven't heard a lot of like new new bands um, that I'm really really into huh White Chapel. White Chapel yeah the White Chapel is cool you know but um, like old school stuff Black Sabbath uh, Metallica and whatnot but more more industrial metal for sure yeah it'd be so cool if you played with uh, like there's these newer bands I don't know if you were thinking about these but like Behemoth and like like uh, you know Sleep like there's just like more you know newer bands that I think would love I'm going to hook you guys up with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Next. Hey. 
Hello. So I'm, I'm a pianist and a huge gamer, and I remember reading on the bio intro that you also worked with League of Legends. I'm kind of curious how that went. Oh, yeah. So I play. oh my gosh, I forgot what year it was. I think it was three championships ago when I was in LA at the Staples Center. Yeah. Do you remember? I think it was a few years ago. Um, they just reached out and said, uh, would you want to play for the for the championship? So we opened it. Uh, it was myself, Wes Borland from Limp Bizkit, um, and then the drummer from uh, Comba Christ, who just left the band, uh, and then Crystal Crystal Method, and an orchestra. So it was like this big, like m not a mess. So it was an like organized mess of just stuff. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. And my brother was really, my little brother, he's a huge League of Legends player, him and his wife, so they were, like, totally geeking out. And they, I remember they gave us a, a gift bag, and there was this, like, stuffed, like, animal thing from, and then they are like, oh, my God, can I have it? I'm like, sure, you can have it. So they were happy about it. I think they were more excited than I was, you know, so. You also have a God of War music video coming out, right? Actually, yeah, it just, it came out, I believe, last month. Um, so yeah, I did a cover of the God, uh, God of War. I try to play the game. I'm not very good at it, but uh, it's hard. It's good, it's but it's hard. It's really hard. Oh my goodness. Uh, but yes, the the video is out on YouTube now. It's really cool. You guys check it out. Thank you. Anyone? Got time for one more question? It smells good in here. <laughs> As, yeah, is that curry? <laughs> <laughs> is that it? We good? Okay. Well, thank you. Guys. Well, you guys, uh, can you tell uh, Can you tell people where they can find you on the internet? Yeah, so Tina Guo, G-U-O. Uh, if you just go to tinaguo.com, that is my website. And there's links to everything. I'm on, you know, the usual Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I don't need to tell you guys. You know, so. <laughs> if you just Google it, you can write to me. Okay. So, oh, Google her. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, but thank you so much for coming. That was so awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.